Welcome to Concordia. We are so glad you have joined us here for worship today. Our service will be about an hour long and include music, scripture, and an encouraging message for your week ahead. Our free app provides a worship guide and sermon notes if you want to follow along. You can find the app by searching Concordia San Antonio in your app store. If you are joining us for the first time today, we'd love to meet you. You are invited to stop by one of the welcome kiosks in the lobby so we can say hi, answer any questions you may have, and give you a special gift as a reminder of your time here. Each week, our Sunday school hour begins at 9.30, including adult Bible class that dives deep into God's Word, Bible studies for junior high and high school students, as well as Sunday school classes for kids ages pre-K 3 through 5th grade. Concordia seeks to share God's love through service in our ongoing Love Essay program. If you are interested in volunteering here on campus or in the community, you can find the current opportunities online at concordia.cc slash loveessay. Worship is about to begin. Thanks for being here today, and we hope you enjoy your time at Concordia. You are always welcome here.
Good morning. It's good to see you. Yeah, please be seated. I'm glad you're here. Those who are in the sanctuary and those who are online, welcome to Concordia. What a blessing to be with you this morning as we continue in the season of Lent. It began on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. And Sundays called That's a Great Question. And we'll be taking a look at some questions, not questions that you and I ask, questions that God asks of us. And so we'll dig into that a little later on. But right now, let's continue with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, for the chance to gather around word and sacrament, for the promise that you are here in our midst. Lord, bless us and strengthen us for this time we spend, that we would be prepared to serve you with our lives, to walk with you, and to focus our hearts and minds on your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, oh, we live for you, Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes and Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only
we begin our service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we enter into this season of Lent, it gives us an, a, a beautiful opportunity to prepare ourselves. And that's what Lent is all about. It's, it's a time of repentance and preparation in which we reorient ourselves as the people of God into the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And the way we do that is by coming before God in honesty and transparency, to recognize that we are sinful and broken and that we need God's love and grace. And so I invite you in this time of confession to lay it all out before God, to be honest with him and transparent and ask for what you need. Let's go before God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, humble and broken, Lord, recognizing that we are sinful in ways that we can't even comprehend. Lord, we sin against you in the things we've done and in the things we failed to do. We have not loved our neighbor, we have not loved ourselves. We have not lived in obedience to your law, and so God, we deserve your punishment. But God, we recognize that you are good and gracious and kind and that you sent your son Jesus to redeem us from the pit. And so Lord, in this time of prayer, we come before you and we lay before you those sins that weigh heavily on our hearts. Hear the good news of the gospel. Almighty God, who is rich in mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I announce to you that your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Will the congregation please ride for the reading of scripture? The scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, where we read verses 13 through 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. This is the word of the Lord. The children in the balcony are invited to come down at this time. Please join me as we speak the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father. Please be seated as the children come forward for the children's message. See just a few more friends coming. We'll get started, okay? Good morning. How is everybody today? Good. I'm glad to hear it, and I'm glad you're here. You know, we're, we're talking about questions, and I know all of us ask questions, right? Everybody does. Kids, adults, everybody asks questions. But these questions are questions that God asks us. And the question today is a really interesting one. Jesus, because you know he's God, right? 
Jesus asks the disciples, who do you say that I am? In other words, who am I? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? And it's a really important question. And what's interesting is that Peter answers and he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Who would you say Jesus is? If he asked you, what would you say? Um, you are the Son of God. Okay, great answer. That he's our Savior? Our Savior, yeah, good answer. What else, who else has an answer? What would, you ask, what would you say if Jesus asked you, who do you say that I am? What would you say? Say that he hears us. Yeah, he does. He's the one who hears our prayer. Sure. Good answer. You guys are smart. Good job. Well, something else happens that's really interesting. So Peter says, you are the Messiah or the Christ, the, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, Peter, you are right, but my father gave you that answer. Isn't that interesting? Now, sometimes in school, it's not good if you get your answers from somebody else, is it? But when it comes to our faith, it turns out it's a good thing if God, by the Holy Spirit, gives us the answer. Because not only did the Father give Peter that answer, he gives us that answer. In fact, anybody, anybody who says, Jesus, I believe in you, we say that because God has given us that answer. Isn't that amazing? And so we know that if God gave us that answer, we can trust it's always right, isn't it? So I want to pray about that. I want to pray and ask God to strengthen our faith in the answer he's given us. So dear God, thank you for your love and for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Help us to trust the answer you have given us and grow in our faith every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great job, everybody. Thanks for coming up here. You can head back to your seats. I hope you have a wonderful week. God bless all of you. As the kids make their way back to the seats, I'd like to invite the ushers forward at this time to receive the tithe and offering. We want to thank you for all the different ways that you contribute to the ministry of Concordia, whether it's through your tithe or your talents or the time that you dedicate to serving in the different ministries, whether it's Love SA or Sunday morning uh, welcoming or, or fellowship. We, we just thank you for being a part of this vibrant community as we seek to serve the city of San Antonio. And we do that in a lot of different ways. And so we hope that you'll consider joining us in those different volunteer opportunities. We also want to welcome any newcomers today, any guests that are in attendance this morning. We're really glad you're here. We hope that you will make it a point to come and introduce yourself to either myself or Pastor Tucker or to any of the members of the staff, or just introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you. And if you are looking around this morning and you see someone maybe you haven't seen before, make it a point to introduce yourself. Let's be a community that is welcoming and engaging to guests. We also have a gift for you as you leave uh, server this morning. There's uh, a gift in the narthex. We just want you to feel welcome when you come to Concordia and to come back anytime you like. If you're watching online, we're glad you're, you're visiting with us this morning. We encourage you, if you're ever in San Antonio, consider coming to Concordia. We're glad you're here. We've got the chance this morning to go before God in a time of prayer. And prayer is one of the most powerful tools we have. It's an opportunity where we can trust that whatever we say before God, he listens to and he responds to. 
And so if you are needing prayer this morning, we'll have prayer time right now, but after service, there will be people in the front that are dedicated to praying with you. There are people who will keep your prayer in confidence, but will continue to pray for you throughout the week. And so if you need someone this morning, please feel encouraged to come and pray with someone after service at the front of the sanctuary. You're also encouraged to submit a prayer request online through the website, concordia.cc, or by going to the app and submitting a prayer through there. For right now, let's go before our God in prayer. I encourage you to remain seated or kneel as you're able. Heavenly Father, we come before you today grateful for all that you do. Lord, that you provide for us, that you care for us, that you listen to our prayers. And so, Father, we thank and praise you for who you are. But, Lord, we recognize today that as we come into this season of Lent that that you are preparing our hearts for this beautiful story that you have told through your son, Jesus Christ. And so I pray that we would be a people of repentance and forgiveness and love, that we would reflect the good news of the gospel and the community around us, And Lord, that the good news of this story would spread to the ends of the earth. Lord, we especially remember those places in the earth that are torn apart by war and disease and famine. Lord, we remember the the specific wars happening between the Ukraine and Russia, that you would bring an end to that conflict and that you would preserve innocent lives on both sides. Father, we pray for an end to the war between Hamas and Israel, that you would protect Palestinian lives and Israeli lives. Lord, that you would bring an end to all conflicts, that you would bring peace and healing to our world. And Lord, as our government leaders and the leaders of the world seek to find solutions that you would guide them in wisdom and discernment, that they would come before you and humble themselves and receive the wisdom that only you can provide. Father, I pray for your church, both here and all throughout the world. I pray especially for those who serve as missionaries. Lord, that you would bless and protect them in their work as they bring the gospels to the ends of the earth. Father, I pray for the church here in San Antonio, for Concordia, that we'd be faithful in the ministry that you have put before us. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters that are persecuted for their faith all throughout the world, remembering especially our brothers in Pakistan, that you would protect them, that you would sanctify them, that you would lead them, Lord, and that you would strengthen them with your Holy Spirit. Give them peace in this time. Father, we pray for San Antonio, we pray for our community, we pray especially for those who are servants in our community, remembering especially doctors and firefighters and nurses and policemen for EMT, for all those who serve in a unique capacity, Lord, that you would bless and sustain them in their work and protect them. Finally, Father, we come before you and we offer you prayers and silence for those people on our hearts. Lord, all of these prayers we bring before you. And we pray them in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith, the life everlasting. Go in peace, your sins are forgiven. Amen. When he shall come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the
So our series for Lent, Wednesdays and Sundays, as you can tell, is that's a great question. And it coincides by accident from our perspective. Maybe it's a divine providence. Nothing's a coincidence with God. But it corresponds with something that we are launching. In fact, we launched it this past week. Uh, we are in partnership with an organization called BibleChat.ai. And uh, they have created a, an AI faith assistant to use on our website. And what's interesting about this faith assistant is that it's trained on the Bible, on Lutheran theology, and on the long bunch of sermons and Bible classes and teachings and writings and white papers and all the things from here at Concordia. And so this AI is available on the website, and you can ask it all kinds of questions. In fact, my encouragement to you is to give it a try and, and see what you find. You know, the church has a long history of innovation and using technology for the sake of the gospel. If you think about the printing press, well, Martin Luther made great use of the printing press, newly invented to print Bibles and leaflets and pamphlets teaching Christian faith and Christian doctrine. And so uh, we fall in that line. Think about all of the innovation in the area of music and the use of different genres of music within Christianity and even the internet. My goodness, our own Concordia. We, uh, we 14 years before the pandemic, we were streaming services so that when lots of congregations were just learning how to do that, we'd been doing it for years because we wanted to make use of that technology to bless our Concordia family and to reach people who are beyond the walls of Concordia. And so this is another opportunity to use a technology that is emerging for the sake of the gospel and to bless people. And the idea is that, that it provides a way for people to engage with their questions around topics in the Bible and topics of theology and, and uh, gives them a way to, to go just a little bit deeper and to reference resources and materials and videos from here at Concordia. In fact, the, the company that is putting this together shared with me on Wednesday, I didn't know this, didn't, hadn't even considered it, but they shared on Wednesday that we are the first congregation in the world to develop a tool like this and uh, have it available on their website, which I think is, I also think that's pretty cool. And so... My hope is that you are still applauding after you give it a try. <laughs> but here's the idea. Do I think it's going to work perfectly first time out of the gate? No, I really don't. So far, we've had it tested by lots of different people, members of our staff, by pastors that are friends of mine, by theologians in the LCMS, and the, the result has been pretty good. But we continue to find little things that need to be corrected, answers that need to be adjusted, things that we want to, to refer to person-to-person to -person conversations instead of an artificial intelligence conversation. But my, my hope is you'll give it a try, and you'll let me know. And if you discover something that's problematic, We'll talk about it and figure out it and get it fixed. But uh, I'm excited about this chance to engage in questions. Remember, we've been talking about this for years. The goal of Concordia, so for example, the, the Ask Anything sermons that we do and the website that's created around that, all of that is to demystify the Bible. We've had all kinds of sermon series. In fact, we talk about that that's part of our goal in every message, to take the mystery out, to explain things so you can feel confident about reading the Bible and confident about your faith. And so this is just one more step in that same direction. Well, the series that we're in is not about our questions. They're not about human questions. The series that we're in is about God's questions to us. So as we move forward today, the question that we're going to take a look at is something that God asked through Jesus, who is God and man. He asked of his disciples, who do you say that I am. Now, here's what's interesting. We know that God is omniscient, right? Omniscient means he knows everything. So if he knows everything, why does he ever have to ask a question? What's the purpose? What's the reason? What kind of questions would they be? Well, that's what we're digging into. And so today, we start with actually two questions. The question Jesus begins by asking, what do the people say? Who do the people say I am? And then he focuses on the disciples. And so let's dig in. We are in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. By the way, if this sounds familiar, remember for context, 
We were taking a look at Luke chapter 9 last week, and and this is also a story that's repeated in Luke chapter 9. But here we are, Matthew 16, verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi, just as a reminder, is a a part of of Israel that is way up in the north. It's 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. So it's way up at the northern end of the sea, uh, uh, northern end of Israel. It's in the, the front slope of Mount Hermon. And it's a, a Gentile region. It's not even a, a Jewish area. It's a place that was created to honor a, a Philip, but it was also a place that was created to honor Caesar. So Caesarea Philippi. It was a place of vacation, a place of beauty, it had all kinds of fountains and water features. It had Uh, temples for all of the different gods so you could worship whatever god you wanted to in Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus and his disciples are in this region. And Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, when you hear Son of Man, it's kind of a nebulous term, but it's the term that Jesus used to refer to himself. So he's saying, who do the people say I am? Now, this is a question that's been brewing for a long time. All the way back in Matthew's gospel to Matthew chapter 4, the question has been building up and building up and building up. Interestingly enough, God answers who Jesus is right off the bat. In Jesus' baptism, all the way back in Matthew chapter 3, remember God says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. The The demons have already answered this question. In Matthew chapter 8, if you remember, before Jesus cast the demons out of a man, the demons say, what do you want with us, son of God? So God has answered and the demons have answered, but the people, they're not clear. There is this growing sense of anticipation, this growing sense of significance. There's this growing uh, idea that this, this man is something special. This is some, man is something supernatural. But they can't p- quite put their fingers on it. And imagine, if you were there, if you were living in that time, would you really believe that you are the one who gets to see, gets to hear the Messiah that we've been waiting for for centuries and eons? Now the people are struggling to put their their minds around all of this. But they know that he teaches like no one ever taught before. They know that he's doing astonishing miracles. And they know that the crowds around him are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the the disciples answer. Well, some say... John the Baptist. This is, a, this is a thought that was really created by Herod. So remember, Herod is the one who put John the Baptist to death. And then after he had killed John the Baptist, he heard about Jesus and all the things he was doing and the miracles and the teachings and the, the judgment that he was proclaiming. And Herod said, this must be John the Baptist come back to life. And so one of the answers of the people is that he is John the Baptist come back to life. Others say Elijah. And during this time in Israel's history, there was a a thought that Elijah would come back. And it was fed by the idea, remember, Elijah didn't die. Elijah crossed the Jordan River, and then he was taken up in a chariot of fire. And the idea is, if he was taken up in a chariot of fire, he can come back in a chariot of fire. And so, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets, And the reason for that is because so much of Jesus' life and ministry is foretold in the book of Jeremiah. So much of what Jesus did in terms of condemning the the ruling elite and the religious leaders is also from Jeremiah. The judgment of Jerusalem and the prediction of its fall, that's all from Jeremiah. And so some of the people are saying, well, this has got to be the prophet Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. But then Jesus turns it around. He puts the onus on his disciples, and rightly so, don't you think? I mean, in Matthew 13, Jesus says to his disciples, you are blessed because the secrets of the Father have been revealed to you. 
In other words, Jesus has not only been, they've not only been with Jesus to see his miracles and to hear his parables and his teachings, but they've also had him ple- speak plainly to them about what's going on. And so the disciples are the ones, if anybody has an idea, if anybody has a clue who Jesus is, it should be the disciples. And so he says, what about you? Who do you say I am? And not surprisingly, Peter speaks up, right? And Peter speaks on behalf of the disciples. You can imagine that these guys have been talking to one another. After things happen, they're they're beginning to question. In fact, they've even speculated after things like the the occasion where Jesus calmed the storm. You know, they said, this must be the Son of God. I mean, they have this idea, this kernel of knowledge that's forming in their minds, but they just can't believe it. They just can't put their arms around it. And so they're, they're in this process of deliberating. And when Jesus says that, Peter speaks up. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, I want to I clarify something because we've talked about this before, but just so there's no mistake in your mind. So the word Messiah is from a Hebrew word, and it, it corresponds to a word from Greek, which is Christ. And so the word Messiah and the word Christ mean the same thing. They mean the anointed one. Now, you also need to understand that the, the word Christ or the word Messiah is not a name for Jesus. It's not like his last name, Jesus Christ. It's a title. It's a job. It's a, a vocation that he is the Messiah or he is the Christ. And understand that, that when we say Christ or Messiah, we're talking about an anointed one who was anointed for a specific purpose. So in that day and age, people were anointed to be priests. They were anointed to be prophets. They were anointed to be kings. And all three of those different uh, uh, titles or jobs carried with them certain responsibilities, certain, certain things that you would expect of them. But when it comes to this idea of Messiah, the Messiah was anointed for a purpose, but the understanding of that purpose was really confused. There were lots and lots of different ideas about who the Messiah would be or what the Messiah would do. And so I want to come back to that in just a minute. But I want to to focus here on Peter's answer for a minute because Peter gives this great answer. But notice something. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. When he says Simon, son of Jonah, again, that's that's an identifier. Simon bar Jonah means not that he's related to Jonah, the, the guy in the Old Testament, It means that Jonah was his dad's name. It's clarifying who he's talking to. Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you. Who I am was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Now think about that for a minute. He's saying to Peter, not only do you have the right answer, but you have the right answer because my Father gave it to you. This isn't of you, Peter. You didn't finally figure it out and put all the pieces together. You haven't had enough conversations with the disciples. You haven't watched enough things happen that it now has all come together for you. What you are professing has been given to you by my Father. You know, when I think about that, it makes me think about our confirmation interviews. So we just finished confirmation interviews. For those of you who have been around, you probably know about confirmation interviews. For those who are are new to Concordia, all of our junior confirmation students, so mostly sixth graders, but a few seventh and eighth graders, uh, they'll be confirmed that first uh, first Saturday in May. And so kind of the last big hurdle to being confirmed is an interview with me. And over the years, this interview has, has taken on a, a mystique of its own, right? I mean, the kids, they don't sleep the night before. They come in, they're terrified. And it always makes me marvel, you know, what are they being told, right? I mean, I love these kids. I'm looking forward to the time with them, but they come in and they are terrified. But the confirmation interview is a chance for me to talk to them. You know, so I, they come in, I ask them about their activities, I ask them about what kind of sports or music or art or drama, whatever they're involved in, I get to hear about their, their 
things that are interesting. I ask them about their pets, about their siblings, about their parents. I ask them about their favorite subjects in school. I mean, it really gives me a chance for just a few minutes with each of these young people to get to know them a little bit more, to hear what makes them tick. And then after we talk for a little while, we we move into the confirmation interview. And I will tell you that they have a review sheet, and they actually talk to Pastor Mark or one of the other pastors before they come in to see me. They go over that review sheet. I mean, this should be like shooting fish in a barrel. The review sheet has all of the answers to everything I'm going to ask them. And they go through this sheet, and they come in, and, and we begin talking, and I ask them such easy questions. Because the goal is to, is to sort of get them moving, right? To get them going, to, to make them sort of get in the flow of things. And then we, we come around and I say something like, well, you know, if you take a look at confirmation from the big picture, you're moving from being a child in the faith to a young adult in the faith. But the thing that you're going to experience probably most directly is that you, you start taking communion. And in the Bible, it tells us two things about communion. One, that you have to be prepared every single time. And and they go through some questions that they need to ask themselves. And then, after we finish with that, I say to them, you know, when you go up for communion, I know that there's bread and there's wine. But what about the body and blood of Jesus? Is it really there? Now, again, this is all in their sheet. So they, they say, oh, yeah, it's there. I say, great. What makes you say that, or, or who, who told us that it's there? And again, they, they're usually kind of right on top of this. They'll say, well, Jesus told us. Jesus said so. I say, oh, awesome. So what did he say? That's usually when their eyes freak out. I don't know if I remember that. But we work our way around and we come back to to what Jesus said and what we've said so often. They've heard it so many times it becomes almost rote once they begin to hear the words if they're struggling. Jesus said of the body, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink of the wine, this is my blood. And I say to them, ah, awesome. So when you say that, it sounds like he's saying that his body and blood is really there. And they go, yep. I said, well, you know, do you think it could be a mistake? I mean, I make mistakes, you make mistakes. Maybe Jesus made a mistake. No way. I said, well, could we cut Jesus a little slack? I mean, maybe he just made a mistake. Why wouldn't Jesus make a mistake? And they, they work their way around, and ultimately they get to the point where they tell me that he is the son of God. I say, ah, yeah, you're right. So here's the big question. Are you willing to risk all of the work that you've put in all of the time? Are you willing to risk having to go through confirmation all over again to stick with that answer? Usually that's when their eyes become gigantic. Usually they say, could you repeat the question? (laughs) Say, sure. The question is, when you go up for communion, the, body and, the bread and wine is there. What about the body and blood of Jesus? Is it there also? I say, now I want you to take your time. This is really important, and you've done so well up till now. I don't want you to mess this up. Think it through. Think through all of the details, all of the parts all of the different things, do you really think the body and blood is there? And sometimes they, they're immovable. Sometimes they get a little freaked out. But every single one of our confirmation students, as of Thursday, have stuck with that answer. But here's the, here's the part that I think is so important. Then I get to say to them, why did I do that to you? Why did I make it seem so confusing and so hard? And sometimes they'll say you try to trick us. Sometimes they say you try to test us. But, but I say, well, you know what? Let me tell you from my perspective what I was doing. I think that maybe your faith gets tested sometimes. But in the future, it's going to get tested a lot. 
And I wanted to know, if I made it seem confusing and hard, if I made you question whether your answer was right or not, I wondered if you would stick with what Jesus said no matter what. And then I get to say, and you did. Did you realize your faith was that strong? And usually they say, nope. And I say, well, it is. And if you can stick with what Jesus says here in my office, then you can stick with what Jesus says anywhere, anytime in your life. Because here's the thing. If somebody says, you're going to kill me, and in three days I'm going to rise again, and then they do it, we can pretty much believe anything he says, don't you think? Dear friends, you understand, what we go through in the confirmation interviews is exactly, exactly what's happening here. These young people have been given a gift by God. It's not because of their study. It's not because of their their personal strength. It's not even because of their families. All of that has perhaps helped it and strengthened it, but what they've received is a gift from God to say in their hearts and their minds, I believe in Jesus. He is my Savior. He is my Messiah. He is the Son of God. It doesn't get any more correct than that. Now here's the interesting thing from the text. When Peter says Jesus is the Messiah, what does that mean to him? Because remember, the the whole idea of Messiah is deeply rooted in in Jewish theology, in Jewish culture, in Jewish uh, uh, history. But also remember, at this particular time in the first century, the Jewish people are oppressed and occupied by Rome. The thing that they want more than anything, the thing that everybody except a few tax collectors want is for the Romans to be kicked out. They want freedom. They want self-direction. They want self-governance. And they want the Romans to be long gone. And so over the course of time, their idea of what the Messiah will be has been factored in to this desperate desire in their hearts. And so now, perhaps the most widely held perspective of who the Messiah will be is this idea that says he is going to be anointed as a military and and political leader. He is going to be someone who will kick the Romans out and usher in a reign of peace and prosperity. That the Messiah will be the son of David, sitting on the throne of David. But he's going to be this military political leader. And if you say, well, well, how do you know that? Well, think about the triumphal entry. Think about Palm Sunday. As Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, what are the people shouting? Hosanna what? Son of David. And the word Hosanna means save us. Save us, son of David. The problem is, that's not who God's Messiah is. God's Messiah is sent to deliver people but he's sent to deliver people from the brokenness of sin, from the reign of death, from the the bondage to Satan. He's not a political leader. And that's why the text goes on. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Now you can imagine how shocking this would be. This is literally the moment. From this point on, Jesus and the disciples are making their way back to Jerusalem. They're making their way back to the cross, to the tomb, to the resurrection. And Jesus is saying, he's trying to inform the disciples' perspective. He's trying to realign their understanding of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, with the Messiah of God and what he is supposed to do. And the disciples, they want nothing to do with it. In fact, look what it says. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Says Jesus turned to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
mean, Jesus lays it all out. And then he goes one step further. In fact, what he does is, by implication, he poses another question. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What's the question? What's the implied question that Jesus is asking his disciples and you and me? Will you take up your cross and follow me? Even though I may not be the the Messiah who pours out prosperity, even though I may not be the political leader who is going to, to wipe the slate clean, even though I'm not going to do the things that you may want me to do, If I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, if I am going to deliver you and the world from bondage to sin and death and the devil, are you willing to take up your cross and follow me? Dear brothers and sisters, that's the Lenten question. Will you take up your cross and follow Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, by the power of your Spirit at work in our hearts and minds, I pray that you will make the answer yes. And Lord, not just in our hearts and minds, allow that answer to be yes each and every day as we follow you, as we live for you, as we share the hope that we find in you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, dear friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go into the world and shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the message of life. Amen. Have a great week.